6. Steel Graveyard According to a U.S. defense official, Ukraine has become a graveyard for Russian tanks since war broke out, with nearly 1,000 main battle tanks MBTs, damaged or rendered essentially useless. At least 50 helicopters, 30 fighter bombers, and 350 pieces of artillery are among the additional Russian vehicle casualties in Ukraine. Russia has also lost more soldiers in the first three months of war than the Soviet Union after 10 years in the Afghan war. These figures are much more conservative than those provided by the Ukrainian general staff. It stated that their forces had destroyed 970 Russian tanks, 2,389 armored personnel vehicles, 431 artillery systems, and 151 multiple launch rocket systems. That's on top of 187 aircraft, 155 helicopters, 71 air defense systems, 1,688 vehicles, 8 ships, a light speedboat, and 215 unmanned aerial vehicles. Quite the expensive fight. Despite all this destruction, the Kremlin is still far from declaring victory. In fact, the situation has become so bad that the tank's days are likely numbered. Visitors to the Ukraine capital are met by Russian tanks, thanks to Russian defeats, which have served as propaganda for Kiev. But instead of marching in as part of a victory parade or seizing the city in combat, tanks have simply been put on display as war memorabilia to ridicule the Russian effort and President Vladimir Putin's greedy aspirations. According to Forbes.com, Moscow has started deploying 60-year-old T-62 tanks to boost their numbers. The losses are so severe that they're practically forced to scrape the bottom of the barrel. Despite the fact that many of the older armored vehicles were barely viable to begin with, the Kremlin has kept thousands of them, and Russia is working around the clock to restore as many of them as possible. When more advanced tanks like the T-90M are failing to change the course of war, it's difficult to envision how outdated machines will perform. With the Nazis being driven out of Ukraine about 80 years ago, Russia may even need to mobilize its T-34 tanks from World War II. The surplus T-34s were purchased by the country in 2019 from Laos, with the intention of using them as props in movies and museum exhibits. But it wouldn't be entirely out of the question to see them show up in Ukraine. 5. Nike Missile Site The abandoned SF-09C Nike Missile Radar Data Acquisition Station, which was used for launching anti-aircraft missiles during the Cold War, is now home to mysterious stone cats. The missile base is buried within the slopes of Richmond's Wildcat Canyon Regional Park in California. There's no historical marker at the site where radar operators once watched over the Bay Area skies 24-7 during the Cold War, watching and waiting for possible Russian bombers at all hours. A mile 1.6 kilometers south of SF-09C was the actual Nike missile launch pad, where operators were ready to raise 24 Nike Ajax supersonic anti-aircraft guided missiles to the surface and launch at a moment's notice. Each missile weighed 2,000 pounds, 907 kilograms, and had a range of 25 miles, 40 kilometers. Even with so much weight, they could travel at twice the speed of sound. You can hike to the top of San Pablo Ridge and descend to the exact location of the former top-secret SF-09C base. Sadly, all that's left today are a few concrete pads and empty roads. The abandoned site preserves a small fragment of Bay Area history. The missile launch and storage facilities were quickly demolished after being decommissioned. Afterward, the administration and housing buildings were filled up with soil. While exploring the crumbling foundations, you'll come across strange stone cats that an unknown artist installed. No one is sure who put them there or why, but they bring some whimsy and friendliness to the desolate concrete hilltop. The American Army turned over management of all 11 Nike missile sites to the National Guard back in 1958. As military technology advanced in 1962, the sites were rapidly demolished, making a long-range bomber attack unlikely. 
the era of mutually assured destruction had begun, and the American defense strategy had shifted. By 1974, the last four Nike missile facilities in the Bay were permanently shut down. Would you explore an abandoned missile silo? Let us know in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe. Four, Goli Otok. Those who have had the misfortune of being confined in this prison call Goli Otok a living hell. The facility, which is located two miles, three kilometers off the Croatian coast, served more as a holding space for war prisoners and political dissidents than it did for small-time offenders. During World War I, Austria-Hungary kept Russian troops on the island. Yugoslavia's communist revolutionary leader Josip Broz Tito cut ties with the Soviet Union in 1948 as Cold War tensions quickly grew. Goliotok soon evolved into a political jail and work camp. In a CIA report, it was referred to as Tito's Adriatic Devil's Island, and it was believed to have served as a jail for both Stalin sympathizers and opponents of Tito's rule. According to some documents released by the Central Intelligence Agency in 1970, during the prison's busiest years of 1948 to 1955, Tito's dictatorship rounded up political dissidents. It was believed that over 15,000 people were transferred to the Little Island by 1956, and that over 600 of them died there, some presumably from torture. When the Iron Curtain started falling in Eastern Europe at the end of the 1980s, the jail closed its doors. At that time, the Berlin Wall had fallen and the Soviet Union was crumbling. The island currently stands in ruins. The prison's remains have served as a chilling reminder of Tito's authoritarian dictatorship. Only the occasional sheep is spotted raising the island's 1.5 square miles, 3.9 square kilometers, of sparsely vegetated ground. The only visitors are brave tourists who come to bear witness to the prison's rubble. A Dutch filmmaker named Bob Thiessen is focused on examining and recording ruins like those at Goliotok. He visited the island in 2016 and captured footage of the abandoned buildings. He told National Geographic that it was extremely eerie to walk amongst the decaying prison. The cells are still there, and you can even see the high walls that once kept prisoners at bay. His film displays the collapsed steel skeletons of mid-century structures. In abandoned workshops where convicts were forced to work, tools and workbenches are still scattered about. Thiessen spent the night camping on the island and spoke of its haunted and peaceful absence of plants and animals. But there aren't any ghosts, he says. 3. Bielitz Heilstaden Bielitz Heilstaden is a huge structure with an interesting, if not eerie, past. It was built to treat patients with deadly diseases like tuberculosis. The hospital, which had 60 structures, was constructed in Berlin between 1898 and 1930. Because of its size, a small village with a post office, butcher, and restaurant were established around its perimeter. During World War I, a portion of the hospital was used to treat wounded soldiers. A young Adolf Hitler was once a patient, who, at the Battle of the Somme, received a leg injury and had been blinded by a British gas assault. These wounds earned him the Iron Cross. Ironically, it was because of this and his rapid recovery that the hospital was eventually able to treat injured Nazis during World War II. It was taken over by the Russians in 1945, and for the next 50 years, long after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, it was used as a Soviet military hospital. Everyone was treated at the facility, from communists to the disgraced leader of Eastern Germany, who was brought there after being ejected in 1990. A small portion of the giant hospital is still in use today for Parkinson's disease research and neurological rehabilitation. But most of the complex, including the surgery ward, psychiatric ward, and rifle range, has been abandoned and allowed to retreat into the surrounding forest. 2. Willard Asylum 
Although the idea of an asylum can conjure up images of gloomy, tortured lives, Willard was created as a better alternative to the existing systems used to care for the mentally ill. Early 19th century alms houses, essentially shelters, were often overcrowded and underfunded. They were left to care for individuals who were incapable of caring for themselves. Sylvester D. Willard, Surgeon General of New York, suggested a state-run hospital for the insane after facing these appalling conditions. The idea was approved by Abraham Lincoln himself six days before his death. In 1869, Willard received its first patient, Mary Rote, a woman who had spent 10 years confined in an almshouse. She was characterized as demented and disfigured. Sadly, patients hospitalized here were previously neglected. One prisoner came to Willard in a chicken crate, while another had been chained up in a tiny cell since adolescence. Because of the terrible circumstances patients were coming from and the lack of knowledge over mental illness, Willard effectively turned into a dumping ground for undesirables. Severe mental and physical disability, nervousness, chronic to acute insanity, feeble-mindedness, and lunacy were among the patient's common ailments. The asylum was created in a design similar to several Victorian institutions. A men's side and a women's side separated the university. The center had several administrative buildings. Since the area had been used for farming in the past, the institution had its own garden where patients tended and grew food. They were not restrained and were free to go about as they pleased, though unable to leave the premises. Patients participated in fun, camp-like activities, including sewing lessons, bowling, a movie theater, and a gymnasium. Numbers in facilities decreased dramatically after Geraldo Rivera's 1972 expose of the awful circumstances seen at Willowbrook Asylum. In 1995, Willard Asylum released its last prisoner and closed its doors for good. After the shutdown, a cleaning crew discovered hundreds of dusty bags in the attic, once brought by patients after their admission to the hospital. The items inside them painted a melancholy portrait of their ill owners, who were identified by handwritten baggage tags. Virginia W. had a clown doll, while Earl B. brought a newspaper story on a smuggling plot. These patients passed away at Willard, and no one outside the institution claimed their personal belongings. The workers organized and compiled the luggage in the attic, since they refused to just throw it away. Currently, data on the owners of the luggage is kept by the Willard Suitcase Project. Photos of the nearly packaged bags show that the inmates and their families thought they would merely be passing through. Simply said, they didn't know what to do with these individuals who couldn't conform to strict 19th century social norms. So they were often sent away to facilities. Even if those who lived and passed away at Willard have vanished into the web of history, the possessions they left behind show proof of their existence. 1. Lorton Reformatory the Night of Terror refers to a string of horrible incidents that happened at the Lorton Reformatory in Fairfax County about a century ago. The name seems like it belongs in a horror book, but the events of November 15, 1917 were quite real. The jail was first referred to as the Okokwan Workhouse when it was built in 1910 as an industrial farm. The workhouse was a prison reform experiment built to see if pushing hard labor as a form of rehabilitation would be effective. The initial farm was constructed by the inmates themselves using locally produced bricks. A nearby women's workhouse opened not long after in 1912, housing convicts accused of prostitution, disorderly conduct, or intoxication. While serving out their sentences, the ladies managed laundry and other tasks around the jail. But on November 14th and 15th in 1917, 33 women, called the Silent Sentinels, were put through unimaginable torture and abuse at the hands of 40 jail workers and guards. This was a new, more cruel form of punishment. The Silent Sentinels had been protesting for women's voting rights outside the White House in Washington, D.C. The ladies were a part of a national women's party, which was headed by Alice Paul and Lucy Burns. The group persisted in their courageous vigils in spite of previous arrests. 
They were finally detained once again on the evening of November 14th and sent to Lorton Reformatory, where the infamous warden, W.H. Whitaker, met them with a twisted and terrible justice. Up until their release two weeks later, the women were put through continued violence and given stale food. More and more people joined the cause as knowledge of this suffering spread. It ultimately resulted in the 19th Amendment being passed in 1919, formally giving women the right to vote. After the Night of Terror, the Lorton Reformatory functioned as a jail for over 90 years. Lorton was selected to be a Nike missile complex during the Cold War in the 1950s, and it remained the site of a missile bunker until 1974. Lorton Reformatory, or Lorton Prison, closed in 2001, when the remaining inmates were sent away to other institutions. Over time, it gained a reputation for its awful conditions and extreme overcrowding. For many years, Lorden Reformatory's cells and hallways could be seen in crumbling decay, as time eroded the prison bars and grounds. Even so, it's safe to say that the brave women's energy could still be felt within the dark prison walls. The shouts of equality and justice must have filled the air exactly as women like Alice Paul and Lucy Burns planned. Thanks for watching. Let us know in the comments which location was your favorite, and don't forget to hit like and subscribe. See you next time.